It's the Endo Sync on July 12. And the agenda today is to talk about vetted shims, a an issue we've been kicking down the road since issue number 422. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and embarrassingly, the solution is going to be a very small code change based off of the plans that we've put together. And we will probably have that out soon. Um, but let's get on the same page about whether it addresses your needs. Um, uh, Gal, you want to talk about what your needs are for vetted shims again? I, you know what? Actually, I'm just going to tell you what the design is verbally. As I assume that some of you have read it, but the idea current, the idea is that the lock lockdown currently is broken up into, um, it has two internal phases in the first phase, it repairs the intrinsics and that means taming some of the intrinsics followed by creation of some new intrinsics followed by um repair uh, uh followed by erasing any of the properties of the intrinsics that were not permitted by the hardened javascript language this and then and then a latter phase where the shared intrinsics are hardened and and the fact that it's broken up into these two phases that fit well with vetted shims is not a coincidence. It was actually written in uh, in these two phases uh, in anticipation of running vetted shims af after the repair phase and before the hardening phase. Right. So our intention is to expose a new function called repair that receives the lockdown options. The lockdown options are, in effect, entirely repair options. So we might just rename them. <laughs> uh, such that you can call repair first and then run vetted shims and then call lockdown later. Um, and there, there's uh, the design that the other design family that we considered was one where we kept just the lockdown function and instead exposed an API for modifying what was permitted after lockdown. Um, but that create that would have required more hooks into the lockdown constructor so that other so that vetted shim code could execute on the stack of lockdown and um we decided to go with the model where shims as they are already today in general are just code that executes on at time of in, of initialization that upgrades the language from a previous version to a subsequent version um and and so uh, separating repair and lockdown works out pretty well for that and doesn't require any other API. Um, uh, for just to, to clarify, um, uh, Hello. the Hello. idea is that after lockdown, a lot of the shims that can run are existing shims that happen not to conflict with the repaired environment. Um, uh, and our sense is that many existing shims not written to run in the repaired environment well, can will nevertheless run compatibly in the repaired environment and do their shimming job. Yeah. So so essentially, uh, there are, every shim is a shim that takes the language from a previous version to the next, um, like JavaScript before having array prototype dot at and then versus after the shim. Here's a new language where this exists. Um, so. The repair function and lockdown functions are effectively shims that would be executed as part of the initialization of the setup of your start of, of your of your language and the order in which other shims land is entirely based off of the implied dependencies between them um that the, it's up to you as the creator of a hardened javascript environment to um produce a sensible order for the shims based off of their internal dependencies. So some shims, for example, um, would run, could run before repair. Some of them will have to run after repair before lockdown and some should can run after lockdown. And we're also eventually going to introduce a new kind of shim that specifically is able to um, upgrade the shared intrinsics. And upgrading the shared intrinsics will require that your um, 
then you're in a language that has a get intrinsics function and also that the repairs have already been applied. Um, uh, this means that between repair and lockdown, it will be possible to introduce, it will in time be possible to introduce new shared intrinsics. And as a consequence of that, it will be necessary to be able to harden them before you've called lockdown, uh, or at least mark them for hardening upon the time of lockdown. So there's um, another, uh, another. so there are two changes. One is that we introduce the repair function and another where we change the semantics of harden such that harden does not exist upon cess initialization. It is introduced by repair. Um, and then, and it is introduced in an in inert form, well, in, in, a, in a form where anything that is, anything that is hardened between repair and lockdown is not actually hardened, but it is queued to be hardened at the time of lockdown. And then after lockdown, anything that is hardened is hardened immediately. Okay. Uh, another, I um, want to point out that uh, for existing shims that, that pass the vet, you know, the, the manual vetting process, um, uh, in the, prior to there being a get intrinsics uh, API or any way to add to the formal list of shared intrinsics, uh, if the new intrinsics introduced by a shim are reachable by uh, by dotted uh, name path navigation from the global, uh, they will get hardened in the hardening phase anyway. Uh, there's only a special a special hardening arrangement needed when the vetting process reveals that the shim is introducing intrinsics that are not discoverable by name path navigation from the global object. Right, which which means that we can possibly defer the improvements to harden to the second phase where we make it possible to do harden shims. Okay, um, yeah, that's interesting. I think I have a couple of maybe minor questions. Um, so first of all, lockdown without repair is going to work as is as it works today. Yes. So the plan is for purposes of backward compatibility, lockdown will continue to function as it does today, that, that there will not be a breaking change. Um, there yeah. are, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I just, the, the ZB and, uh, uh, echoed a, a discomfort that I have naming wise, which is whatever we actually name the APIs, I think for us discussing the APIs, there are three different functions that we're talking about. There's the, the, there's um, repair, the repair phase, or we just call it repair. There's the hardening phase. And then lockdown is simply repair plus hardening. That's the current lockdown is, is it does the repair and then it does, lock, and then it does the hardening. And if you break them up, uh, calling the hardening phase lockdown is maybe what we end up what we will end up doing by way of API design. But in talking about it, it's confusing to me because to me lockdown is is the pair of repairing and hardening. Yeah. Um, so there are two. Okay. So there are two design families within our choice to split um, the repair and hardening phase in one design family. Um, which is what I proposed is that we introduce a repair func a global repair function and then and then deprecated behavior is calling lockdown with options. And the behavior encouraged going forward is calling repair with repair options and lockdown without arguments at all. Um, so in that in that in that new world, lockdown is the hardening phase okay, um, so in the old world it's the combine you know, the combination but we would be moving away from that understanding um i would find it confusing to have a hardened function that doesn't that having having two functions named harden effectively no 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 the the hardening phase would not be named hard yeah the idea, the idea of overloading Harden to do both jobs, which did come up, I think would be, would be even worse. Yeah. Um, so so I, my, I move to think of the standard 
as that the lockdown function affects the hardening phase, um, period, and that there's this legacy behavior we're trying to forget about. Um, that is slightly inconsistent with the other point I made, which is that sometimes you're not going to want to separately call. There are, there are cases where calling repair and lockdown separately is unnecessary. Um, if you don't need to execute anything in between, then it, then it is ergonomically convenient to use the lockdown function as the repair and the lockdown function. But um, I don't have a strong feeling about that. I, you can you can still express that coherently, I think, is that lockdown uh, will automatically repair the environment if that has not already been done. Right. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the problem is the options. Is It's really weird for lockdown to take options if repair has not been called and for lockdown to refuse options if repair has already been called. Yes, which is necessarily what we'll have to do in order for it to be a coherent user experience. Yeah. Well, so it, it, assuming assuming we use the one name for both for right. for, for both cases, right. uh, the, right. the the concrete API suggestion I found most appealing was that we introduce a namespace object, and that the the repair and lockdown for the new world are methods of the namespace object, and that the global function lockdown. Is um, is just a legacy API that we don't break, but is distinct from uh, namespace dot lockdown. Yes, so that's my that is my second design family suggestion, and we just need to come up with a decision about which one to go for. the 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 design family where we have a namespace object requires us to advance the question of the <laughs> advance the bike shed for what the name namespace ought to be. Um, I threw out a straw poke of security dot and <laughs> mostly because it's awful enough that somebody should be offended enough to come up with a better idea than I don't have one. Uh, I have a potentially worse idea uh, since we already have a capital C compartment, a global namespace uh, that we are shipping. Uh, maybe it would be possible to put uh, those methods on uh, as static methods on the compartment. How um, about is that? It's, 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 I, I, I see your bid and raise you realm. <laughs> since lockdown and, uh, since, uh, lockdown and, re and repair apply to the same realm, having it as a static method on the realm constructor, it seems better. Um, and yet that is difficult to, it is difficult to sell that because um, these functions do not need to exist, must not exist inside of a compartment. So putting them on anything that is a shared intrinsic is undesirable. Um, yeah. Also, it doesn't really just apply to a realm. Uh, any, for example, if you have a shared realm constructor in that realm, I agree. Uh, it the new shared realms will be locked down as well. Potentially, if we have a standardized worker API, uh, something like that later, same thing. So, mm, uh, mm, so yes and no. Uh, when if we elect to expose Shadow Realm to a compartment, I think it's an open question whether new Shadow Realms are implicitly locked. No, no I'm, not, I'm not talking about compartment or not. I'm saying if you lock down your current realm, uh, I believe that the point was that every uh, realm created from there were locked down uh, realms. Yes. Yeah. Actually, the the hard constraint is it's interesting, Hadden. Uh, the hard constraint is that if you lock down a realm, Every realm created from there must be repaired. If it's introduced to a guest. The created from there, meaning that with, with created from within the lockdown realm. Mm -hmm. um, so the I mean the idea is that okay, created from within a um 
within a new compartment within the, the created realm. That one's clear because that one should not have any access to magical powers. Right. Um, right. And it's the repair phase that denies magical powers to a new realm. Uh, and it's the hardening phase that enables the coexistence of mutually suspicious entities within the within the realm. Um, the constraint with regard to not giving access to magic powers to the, to that to somebody <clears throat> creating the realm, uh, they only need um, well, okay, yeah, they need the repair. They also need one other thing, which it's so it's good we we brought this up in this context because it pushes us, um, uh, it points out something we lost in moving away from the callback thing, uh, which is uh, for some some of these shims, what we want to do is register them in such a way that any time you create a new realm, uh, new non-privileged realm, that the registered vetted shims also automatically run um, uh, in the new realm before any other user code gets to run in the new realm. In other words, effectively as part of an extended repair phase. And yeah, the, I, the way, sorry. And the way to think about that is once again, in terms of languages, that if a vetted shim is taking you from language L1 to language L2, in language L2, the shadow realm constructor would be constructing a realm running language L2. So you want the shim taking you from L1 to L2 to also take all realms created in the environment left behind by that shim uh, mm -hmm. to also be realms running language L2. Let's, yeah. let's be more I, specific and call that the shared shadow realm constructor after repair. It's not just shadow realm. This also applies to uh, workers. Um, yes. And so this this problem it, it's it's a problem that I've been wanting to solve for a while. This problem shows up in a, a lot of different places. Uh, so applying shims in uh, all realms that you construct is one of the the places. It shows up in uh, the shared struct proposal, being able to register. Uh, behavior for uh, shared structs uh, in, the, in in all the different workers. It it, uh, it has it has a bunch of applications, and I think that's probably something we should try to standardize uh, independently. Uh, basically, being able to register modules that get uh, executed on the realm creation. Um, I do want to better understand what we're discussing here because it sounds a bit familiar to the things that we're working on snow specifically where we want to be able to ask the browser to x some level of javascript code for all um new realms that comes to life automatically and that way we could lose snow being a javascript shame that is not fully trusted am i getting this correctly is this like uh similar yeah being able to apply uh, code at first round creation uh, before any user code gets evaluated is uh, is what it is. And this can be used for shims, this can be used for, I mean, as Mark mentioned, it's like basically transforming the APIs that are uh, available in the, the global uh, into something you, uh, into what you expect it to be. Yeah. One thing so I like I, about that. Oh. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, I just wanted to say I couldn't agree more. I do wonder. I mean, I'll, I, I assume here that you talk. On the JavaScript. <laughs> I I assume that you're talking about the JavaScript level, and I am more talking about the browser level. And I do wonder how, if those have any overlap, or or maybe <laughs> they should still be like two separate. No, it would have to be specified at the JavaScript language level so that it applies yeah. to every host. So that even if a host uh, introduces an API that, uh, to create other realms, uh, such as Worker, which is a, uh, or, or a night frame or something like that, it would apply in those cases as well. Interesting. Yeah, exactly. I would love to continue that at some point, to, talk, to continue to talk about that uh, maybe on a different 
meeting. It's an approach that um, that seems to bridge the gap between those. If you can register code to run on new realm creation, then all the discussion points about what belongs in that realm are less important because it's easy to set it up the way you want. Yep, a hundred percent. That's something that that we have in common in like the snow problem that we're trying to solve. Even though it's a it's more of a browser um, world, I guess, but we share that. I I think. So back to compartments. Big we question. Compartments to be a uh, shim that was one of those vetted shims. Uh, can compartments be used as, uh, I mean, at least as for the, uh, basically the, the problem is that we need a way to describe a module uh, currently, which doesn't exist yet in the language. Um, I, I, this has to take the shape of a module. The problem also is that it has to be that the module, all its dependencies are already uh, loaded so that the module can be evaluated synchronously in realm creation. Uh, this, this is part this. So the uh, the set shim does not have this behavior, but excesses compartment does. It is possible to inherit an already loaded module by its already loaded source, or to bequeath or to endow um, a child compartment with a module. Um, and that is that remains sensible in the module harmony world where you have the ability to import by source and um uh and, and therefore it takes the shape of having an import hook that uses dynamic import dot, import dot source uh in order to in order to pass a, a shim to a child compartment the uh the the thing that's interesting about compartments is that every compartment has a global this and a separate set of evaluators, including the compartment constructor, um, uh, and pres and presumably including the evaluators constructor. Um, the what I found in writing sesshim is it was necessary to have a make compartment constructor function that arranged for inheritance. Or the this behind the scenes inheritance from one compartment constructor to the next compartment constructor and it doesn't fit the instance inheritance form um uh and it's not it, and it's not prototypal it's right. just literally shared yeah. state from one child compartment to the next a child compartment constructor to the to, to derived child compartment constructors um, yeah, it might be might be good to find a name other than inheritance to describe it, just to avoid these yeah. confusions. Yeah, derivation. I, I I propose derivation. What did you say, Matthew? I said propagation, but yeah, say close enough. Yeah. Um, okay. So, and and then it's interesting too because uh, although we have not exposed this make compartment constructor function available. It is necessary to, to make it available in, in order to implement um, undeniable intrinsics. Mm -hmm. um, or have a notions mechanism that similarly, uh, actually, the um, inescapable intrinsics can be uh, registered as a module that is evaluated. Yeah, could yeah. be. Could also be it could also be exposed as a hook um and the, uh, the or a combination of the two where there's like inescapable hooks that, that I, yeah. I believe all the inescapable logic can be expressed as a module that can be a big, that must be evaluated uh at construction um if we had that yeah, where it bottoms out isn't germane. It just we have it. There just has to be a way to communicate in a, inescapables of some kind or another, um, and that has to be provided in API. Mm -hmm. um, presumably, that API is on the compartment constructor. I don't know because again, this this is not a specific to compartments. If you 
create a uh, a shadow realm, something like that. You want those things to apply as well. Mm -hmm. um, so so I, someone, yeah. someone can need this without ever creating compartments. I I think I don't think that's true. I think that I think that we want repair to leave the shadow realm constructor in the start compartment in in the original realm intact because it has powers that the host should remain able to access and that a shared realm a shadow realm intrinsic in child compartments would be different and inescapable uh i somewhat disagree but um i yeah i'm i'm I, it, the, I, al the alternative is if somebody wanted to do that, they could capture the Shadow Realm constructor before calling repair, but the, the effect is the same. I, I mean, to, to the, the way I think about the, the powers on the start compartment after, I mean, just to, today, the, the powers on the start compartment after lockdown is that I'm sorry, after, after, well, yeah, after, after lockdown, since we're talking about today, is, you know, the, the idea is that the environment post lockdown is one that follows object capability rules, but in which there are endowed powers that are just powerful capabilities, you know, that you can now think of as powerful capabilities but you can think of them as powerful capabilities still within capability rules. So for example, um, we do not leave sloppy function and sloppy eval on the start compartment following repair. Um, uh, the, and I think that's essential because, um, uh, because that sloppy function and sloppy eval enable violation of object capability rules it enables violation of locality um so i think that you know we need to take a look at what what special powers we're talking about and what their implications are and i think following repair there should no longer be even in the start compartment an ability to escape the rules of object capabilities um my my position is that that is not essential. I can see that it's valuable, but it's it's valuable in the same way that scuttling the start compartment entirely is. Um, um, I have a uh, related I, question, but on a different level of abstraction. That's something that I'm not sure if we explored. Uh, yeah, OK, I, I see you want to finish something. Yeah, I, the, the, the finish to complete the thought, I think that um, I think that proceeding in the start compartment as if uh, it, it, that arranging the start compartment to resemble a world in which object capability programming is, is fully that, that, is, that as if it were uh, uh, on standing on the same footing as a confined program is an is an illusion is it's um it's uncanny or uncanny perhaps that's not the word it's that it uh it creates a false sense of object keep a false sense of integrity i don't know what we're it's a false sense that the start compartment does not provide the same kind of confinement that you get inside of a compartment um so so okay so here so here's one criteria is code that thinks it's running in the start compartment it should be the case that code that's running in an actual start compartment should be able to create a new constructed compartment that who's uh, and endow its global with uh, emulated virtualized forms of of what would be expected on a different start compartment uh, and then run in that constructed compartment code that thinks it's running in the start compartment of that other environment so mm -hmm. you want so in just the way, same way we want compartments to enable host virtualization we want compartments to enable start compartment virtualization so perhaps the argument that invalidates my point most thoroughly is that uh 
in order to bootstrap the confined code, you need to use a compartment constructor and you need to use not the original compartment constructor, but the post repair compartment constructor. And at the moment they have the same name and it just depends on whether you're standing before or after repair. Um, it, it, by way of reminder, there is a pre repair compartment constructor and that the compartment shim provides that it, that is just a module loader that provides no confinement and that provides sloppy eval yes so so it's very clear that if we're going to be consistent with our current stance that the compartment constructor left in the start compartment by repair has to be a repaired compartment constructor because if it's not a repaired compartment constructor, then it itself continues to provide sloppy eval. Yeah. Um, I would suggest that, that that's consistent for all of the evaluators, um, that we would replace all of the evaluators in the start compartment to be consistent with that stance, or envision an alternate world where you use a different constructor. But I mean, the repair already does that. It replaces already uh, yes. the function of the yes. constructor. Yeah. Now, Okay, so ZB, go ahead. I, I, I just had a note on this. Like, it, it really strikes me that repair is more than just repairing. It actually is probably doing lockdown, and then lockdown step is really hardening of the intrinsics. So, um, maybe. so what do you, what, if, if, if so? What do you mean by repair is doing lockdown, but lockdown is doing hardening? Uh, repairing is actually locking down the environment and making it in uh, OCAP friendly world. And and the, the second, the lockdown, current lockdown uh, step is really hardening. The the second step of the current lockdown step is really hardening the intrinsics, which is really about not providing a uh, global communication channel, really. Um, so Matthew, if I'm correct, you are arguing that the names are not consistent with the behavior right i'm saying repair doesn't really describe the extent of uh, what is well if we if we actually somehow name repair lockdown but omit the hardening step which then at least it would be consistent with the fact that with the existing fact that that it takes the options as an argument um uh, but uh, but cer certainly the I agree with your account about the what the meaning of these things are. Repair is doing more than repair; it's bringing about an object cap. I think the way I think of this is bring about an object capability world that, in the absence of the hardening step, the realm as a whole is a protection domain. the 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 realm as a whole uh, has no magic power. You know, has no magic powers. It, sub, it can create new realms that are protection domains that have no magic powers. And, but, but, but the realm is still the unit of suspicion, not the compartment. And then the hardening step that hardens the intrinsics allows mutually suspicious protection domains within a realm, whereas repair enables mutually suspicious protection domains um, uh, that are the realms themselves. Uh -huh. Okay, I think I understand that. Uh, ZB, let's flush your idea out. Okay, yeah, this was a very good insight into what lockdown is, by the way. I never thought about it that way. Anyway, uh, what I wanted to bring up is a question if if we consider compartments and uh, realms, uh, it feels implied that the mm, not inheritance but derivation chains uh, would be too independent derivation chains in that case because you can have multiple layers of compartment derivation within one realm is that correct it is correct. You can create a compartment and then that compartment, you create another compartment and that compartment, you create another compartment and then you have derivation chains in a single realm. Yeah, I think the way to think of it is a derivation tree. Mm -hmm. Sure. And at the realm level, they're all 
siblings really uh but they they like they don't have they don't really have a parent child relationship that's why we're trying to avoid like any kind of inheritance or something like that i mean it kind of is parent child but if you look at the rem level like they they all like you don't go through the parent realm to do anything you you go straight to uh to to the you don't go through the parent compartment to do anything you go straight to the realm that's you know, except for import hooks uh the if you use dynamic import from within an import hook you are effectively calling through to the parent ah interesting okay so there is uh no wait no no uh sort of yes yeah uh, yeah yeah if your import hook machinery uses the dynamic import in your own realm to bootstrap the dynamic import behavior of a child compartment or from with you you can use your compartments module loader machinery to serve a child compartment right i mean it's it's more like your import hook is implemented in the compartment so uh by by that effect, it, it's not the compartment itself. It's more the your implementation of the import book. Yes. But, but it's not going to be similar to the behavior of prototype chain lookup. It's uh, closer to make sense. Yes. Adaptive. Where, yeah, where it gets uh, mixed in by default, unless you provide your own implementation at any of the levels. I think adapter exactly. is more accurate. Uh, Mix-in implies the possibility of multiple parents. Maybe that is accurate. <laughs> I suppose you can. Yeah, I'm not sure. You can contrive an import hook behavior that, in any case, um, typically it's going to be a tree. I uh, I thought that at some point, if it's not too late, we could discuss the example that we encountered and then try to apply maybe as a step-by-step -step demonstration of like how repair and lockdown would help us solve that. Um, I think that'll be beneficial for me yes. and also for future listeners. How do you feel about that? Yeah, absolutely. That is exactly what we need to get from this call, apart from some design decisions. Um, uh, apart from bike shedding <laughs> and some important <laughs> design decisions, we do need to verify that the approach that we've chosen uh, solves the problem that you encountered. Uh, that would uh, be nice, yeah. Yeah, so the problem you encountered was that there were properties uh, added to reflect, right? And this is for the decorator, uh, the decorator, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, a deprecated but still existing um, decorator shim. Uh, I think so. I didn't get too deep into what it was trying to achieve. I did encounter the words shim and decorator and metadata also. Um, oh. But like, yeah, effectively what it was trying to achieve is it tried to add a property that I don't remember its name at the moment to the reflect object. Um, and that naturally clashes with lockdown um so i do wonder how using repair and lockdown design would help avoiding that clash while allowing it to do its magic yes so what this means is uh yeah so the implication is that supp supposing that this shim assuming that this shim passes vetting um that it would be sufficient to run the shim after repair but before lockdown such that it modifies the reflect shared intrinsic successfully and then gets hardened um and because it's occurring after repair the property that has been added to reflect won't be later removed um and and will be hardened when the all the intrinsics are hardened because it is discoverable by uh, name path discovery. Um, How does it know? I mean, so anything that lies on 
reflect or any other intrinsic just gets hardened no questions asked biceps yes if it's reachable by name path uh, uh, by name path discovery from the global object uh, then mm -hmm. it, that happens with no with no additional mechanism even so and that happens at the, at the at the lockdown level not the repair level there was far happens i'm going to i'm going to insist on my terminology um sorry um it happens in the hardening phase there's repair and hardening and lockdown equals repair plus hardening so there's oh, the okay. repair phase and there's the hardening phase the vetted shim would run after repair and before hardening um and the vetted shim could just be the shim as is if it passes vetting but where the shim is presumed to have been written without knowledge of cess um and so it just adds something to the to the reflect object it does not say anything about it needing to be hardened but simply because it's discoverable by name path it does get hardened in the hardening phase so uh, done it that is unless it's not enumerable right no 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 uh the the name path discovery uh enumerates uh all name all all uh, properties, uh, whether they're enumerable or not, whether they're okay. symbol names or string named, it's not sensitive to enumerability. So one way that this reflect, this shim on the reflect object could fail a vetting is if it produces a method that returns op mutable objects. Um, well, the return, that, return, that returns a mutable object that that returns the same mutable object if it's yeah. turning a fresh mutable object there's no violation <laughs> uh is this vetting uh only doable by humans auditing as a shim or is there a hope to automate it it's not automatable well Unless you want to invest in formal language verification, but yeah. Okay. Or fuzzing, but. <laughs> fuzzing is not going to get you there. <laughs> um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Are th this is this is a point that I also pointed out on the GitHub thread um, around issue four two two. Um, but are we referring to vetted shims as something that we completely trust? Otherwise, um, there's not much to do about it on the CES side, or is there a reason for us to maybe? have another piece of code declaring what vetted shim are allowed to change and then have lockdown, sorry, the second part, making sure that this is what's happening or yeah. is that unnecessary? No, no. So what we need to make absolutely clear, which we've attempted to make clear in the name, which is, which is not enough, um, is that a, a vetted shim is is a piece of code that you are fully vulnerable to that that your the arrangement the, the that yeah that the that the the host is full, and all of the guests are mutually vulnerable to a uh to a to a vetted shim they're called vetted shims because you must vet them and uh it's not because they've been vetted it's because they must be vetted <laughs> and, uh, um, I have to embarrassingly admit that I might not fully un understand the word that, so I'm going to make sure yeah, I know what it means. Uh, it means audited, basically, that, that it oh. has been reviewed. Yeah, that makes more sense. Um, I think that's what I figured, but I thought it wouldn't hurt asking, so that makes sense. Yeah, so something that has to come with the definition of a vetted shim is an explanation of what the behavior what you are doing as an auditor of a vetted shim and mm -hmm. uh, uh and we we got briefly into that and richard made a really great clarifying clarification about is that 
it this is the the shim must not break the invariants that are that are that are imposed by the by the the totality of lockdown for both creating an OCAP safe environment um and a hardened and then a hardened OCAP safe environment and that's that is to say that it we it, it shouldn't leak uh it shouldn't the, the vetted shim must not leak any additional ambient authority and it must not um it must not introduce any new shared mutable state that could be used as a side channel uh, among i think that's fair yeah yeah and this sense. actually and, and this actually uh this question really helps us distinguish uh deciding to run a vetted shim before repair versus deciding to run a vetted shim after repair. Uh, if you run it before repair, then uh, everything's in danger. If you run it after repair, then the world outside of this realm is not in danger, but all of the separation within the realm is in danger. Okay. Thanks for thanks for the clarification. So I I think that it is on the onus of whomever that's to say me implements this vetted shim um, behavior to provide documentation for this. Um, and so that is a thing to hold me to in review, or or whomever picks this up. Um, okay. Uh, do we intend to address uh, the situation with? uh a nested realm uh having to rerun the same set of shims at some point we need to yeah yes um, but do we want to address it with the api design now or are we open to a potential breaking change later if we can't uh if we can't adapt uh it to the existing API. I think my my preference is to proceed with the design that we have for just separating repair and lockdown because it is safe to do so now and it becomes um, that we force the issue if if and when we decide to reveal um, the shadow realm constructor to compartments. Um, it's already the case that we need to do something for for der derived compartments, but that can also be postponed. Um, that I, that that we remain safe not running vetted shims. Mm, is that true? Do we remain safe not running vetted shim? In yes, we are not consistent, but we are safe. That is presumably because new intrinsics can't be introduced. Yeah. Okay. So on the We're day, potentially even safer, uh, assuming a vetted shim could be buggy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think that we can defer the issue and solve the problem at hand. Um, I am I am with Matthew that we need to surface some API for this in some fashion, either through a hook or uh, or an enumeration of the, of the the shimming behaviors. I I mean the API is simple: is register uh, register a new realm or yeah register a new realm uh, module <laughs> basically. I'm highly distrustful of registration in general. Because... Yeah, but I mean, it's what it is. It's add 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 realm uh, add new realm module or something like that. Yeah, yeah, but then then you're in a position where um, multiple registrations occurring in different places may have dependency on their ordering, and it's my preference would be for that order to be expressed in an array. <laughs> and... No. It, 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 the order is expressed by uh, by the order in which you call this. I 
I don't think the program arranging an array or the program arranging for uh, multiple calls uh, in certain order is the same thing. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think like if it's an array, you would have to have a single invocation, which is not extensible. Like you, you want you want uh, separate. You want things to not have to coordinate. Which is to say that the, the order in which the shims are executed in the start compartment is the order in which they would be. I think that's that's actually probably fair in this. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. We're running out of time, and I have uh, uh, one more uh, boring down to earth uh, thing that we could talk about more on the end user side of things. Okay. Where... Well, one question I think we should settle before we put this topic to bed, and that is whether we're going to continue to discuss the bike shed of whether to namespace and whether to rename the underlying methods before we begin implementation. Uh, I, th I think I think we should continue to to bike shed before we begin implementation, or before we before before we merge anything. We can begin implementation any time. It's just a question of when we merge. All right. So with that with that at hand, um, Gal, please do not expect this to merge or be released this week. <laughs> and ZB, go ahead. Yeah. So going back to our example where uh, a package was modifying reflect, uh, let's say we don't trust the package entirely. And instead, we want to have a vetted shim that introduces placeholders uh, for the untrustworthy but necessary package to do its job. So we would create a setter and getter pairs for the methods that we expect the package to introduce. Uh, the question is, uh, once we uh, uh, once we introduce any form of registration, uh, could the registration pattern or, or the registration idea be expanded? Uh, to the point where we can declare that this particular shim uh, or any code eventually uh, is going to uh, create these new fields on this intrinsic. Would that be considerable? If I understand the question correctly, that is the alternate design family that we have considered and dismissed of having a permit API? No, it's not. The, 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 uh, the thing I was imagining that fits ZB's description is that you run a micro shim um, that's, that, that you, know, you wrote to be trusted between re repair and hardening that creates the properties as placeholders, but the shim, the untrusted shim itself, um, let's, are you guys familiar with the term pony fill? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that if the shim is in fact in the form of a pony fill, that it's not modifying any of the intrinsics, it's just producing new, things that that can be called then you you actually wait till after the hardening phase to run the pony fill itself and then you have a minor mechanism that hooks up the placeholder accessors so that they access the thing that was produced by the pony fill and that would mean we don't have to vet someone else's code implementing this. Uh, we only need to pre-declare that we want a specific carve out, and this could be entirely declarative uh, in in the API. Ooh. Yeah. So being being declarative gets back to to Calvert's point that it's it's at that point the the, the declaration becomes more like a permit modification. I think that it's entirely satisfying that you could you could write a utility module that applies these modifications to your 
Yeah. The utility, utility model, module for shims, for these micro shims, to make it more, to provide a more declarative um, yeah. way yeah, of. That's, that's um, honestly the only way I'm willing to allow a random, or maybe not so random, uh, because from a good author, but. Uh, even so, uh, th that's the only way I would be willing to allow an NPM package uh, to provide implementations uh, for intrinsics while being uh, managed by uh, a large team of people who might not necessarily uh, have a complete understanding of SES. But no, isn't, if, if, isn't the problem that existing uh, polyfills are going to try to override uh, or add to the intrinsics. So this would only work with uh, polyfills that have been modified, right? That those, the, that's, that's why I raised the issue of ponyfills. Yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't work with existing polyfills. That's, that's uh, what I mean. But there, what there are many- What is stopping me from, uh, unless they are overriding the whole global name, but if they're, uh, if they're taking, uh, existing functions on a global namespace and replacing them, I could have a vetted shim that uh, introduces a getter and setter anyway uh, on those uh, for allowing modification. And I can even limit to how many times I want to allow modification. So the only polyfill type is when it overrides the entire capital P promise, for example, right? Adding getter and setters is only help if the polyfill is using uh, assignments uh, to test yeah. those, those things. It doesn't help if they're using uh, defined property. Oh, yes, I, I, I need a proxy. I, 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 would, I would only do this for ponyfills, not for polyfills. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a substantial number of existing ponyfills already. So the, the category is, is, is not insignificant. It, yes, the problem is that the existing dependencies of packages that, like, if you have a demand, if you have a package that depends on the polyfill, which happens often, unfortunately, uh, it's that polyfill that has to run. It's not. I mean, you, I don't know unless you have mechanisms to go and replace the implementation somehow by something you know is equivalent and so on. Well, you can introduce an exit module. You can say, "Hey, I'm going to just no op that import." <laughs> yeah, it becomes a lot more complicated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, the idea of trying to do this with a with a genuine polyfill rather than a ponyfill, uh, to try to to um, trying to arrange to be able to run it after the hardening phase seems very difficult to me. Oh, in any case, yeah. And this if it's untrusted, you you cannot run it before the hardening phase. Is it also the case that this might allow us to move the various grid uh, gradations of override taming into shims? It it sounds like we could instead of having uh, uh, that's a good question. Uh, the override taming has to happen before hardening, and does not need to happen. Yeah. Uh, I think the override taming over any override taming can happen any time bet between repair and hardening. That's that sounds like a really great opportunity for reduction in the size of the SES API over time, anyway, or at least <laughs> at least to mitigate growth. All right, we're over time. I think this has been a great conversation, which we will continue. Um, uh, let's have a, I, I encourage a conversation on bike shedding, the exact shape of this API, better names for repair and lockdown, um, a better name than security for a namespace. If we come up with a namespace, I, I, that is my preference. How about just capital S E S? It's uh, do you short. want a namespace that we can sell to TC39, or is this a namespace that we don't want to uh, introduce breaking changes to, but generally not standardize? Because I thought I think, the we want former... to... I think we want to introduce it to TC39. We want it to be as palatable as possible 
regardless of our <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, for I'm those, sold. So for those just watching the video online, Gal has recommended OCAP. <laughs> I, yeah. yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Now we can bike shed capitalization. <laughs> I mean, isn't that the whole point to allow the page yeah. to, to allow the program to introduce OCAP? Yeah, and that that lets us that lets us sidestep the whole Google um, taboo on the word security. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that's the reason why we moved from uh, SES stands for uh, Secure ECMAScript. Well, we moved from there to um, what was the phrase you used? Untrue, Calvary? untrue. SES stands for Fearless Cooperation. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> i don't know what you're talking about mark <laughs> yeah yeah and also why we why we move from from that term to hardened javascript as the main term for what we're doing is hardening is clearly useful both from a so conventional software engineering perspective and from a security perspective and likewise ocaps so i think that's i think that's really very good Okay, um, I know we forgot to mention this, but there is a door prize. I'll need your address, Gal. <laughs> <For sure. laughs> All right, Roger that. <laughs> Don't expect anything. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, we'll stop the recording.